and so uh, you'll be able to see chapter 13's lecture and I think I'm a little bit behind in posting some of them up so uh, I'll get all of those up obviously here before we um, head into the final okay so um, I'll put this one up and then when we get into the mock final after you've had a chance to work it I'll go through those questions and I'll record that as well okay so that you can see how these are working I don't know this, this is like a somebody planted a trap I'm gonna pick that up and it's gonna explode or something right okay so let's go ahead and let's take a look at capital budgeting decisions chapter 13 what happens here back in chapter 8 we talked about operating budget and we said that operating budget essentially does what covers one year of our operations and we will go let's say a capital budget operating budget in chapter 8 covers one year of our operations and we're basically seeing what our cash receipts are going to be our cash disbursements are going to be and that's how we generate our cash budget and we come up with our budgeted financial statements and we probably do that for each quarter if not on a monthly basis okay but often companies are going to be making decisions that are going to extend obviously beyond just one year and so when we make decisions that extend beyond just one year we call that capital budgeting and when we're dealing with capital budgeting we're going to be seeing that we're going to have to compare cash flows from different periods so we may have an initial investment that we're purchasing say a capital item like uh, equipment and obviously that equipment is not going to just be used for one year it's going to be used for several years so there'll be an initial investment today with cash flows that will be going out into the future if that's the case in order to compare apples to apples we're going to have to discount those future cash flows to their present value so we can compare amounts that we're going to spend now versus amounts that what are going to be spent later or maybe more importantly amounts that we are going to be taking in revenue in later years so we're going to have to be using present value tables as we go through this decision and as I through these discussion as I say that I realize I forgot to open up my present value table so I'll have to do that too present value tables are sitting on can um, on iLearn you have those on iLearn I uh, put them next to the chapter 13 slides and I'll be putting them up on the screen here once I remember to once I open them up a little bit later when we need to use them and I'll show you how to use those present value tables and you will need to use those on the exam you're going to see that they are attached to the uh, mock exam if you didn't print it because um, it wasn't attached before um, I'll give you a, f a, f a page that has that okay okay so let's go ahead and let's take a look at these capital budgeting decisions okay and again these are when we're dealing with long-term type things not just a current year we're talking about purchasing equipment we're talking about replacing equipment we're talking about should we lease or buy equipment or a building we're talking about our plant expansion we're talking about making investment for cost reduction purposes we're going to buy a newer machine that will be more efficient and reduce our operating costs maybe we're going to use hybrid vehicles instead of uh, you know regular gas uh, vehicles to reduce costs whatever and we need to think about these investment decisions both from the standpoint of cash outflows but also what the cash inflows either through a cost reduction or increased revenue okay now when we do these things we basically are trying to think about two potential possibilities one are screening decisions so sometimes I'll get it sometimes we'll say I think I will if I have can straighten back up you got to help me up okay so what happens we talk about screening decisions and we'll say we will only take an investment if it meets certain criteria if it doesn't we're not going to take that investment that's a screening decision sometimes we are looking at the preference between two different decisions or three or four different decisions should we go choice choice a or choice B and using these tools that we're going to talk about will help us to make those sort of decisions okay now when we get into the tools that we're looking at we are looking at three in this class we're looking at the payback method we're looking at net present value method we're looking at internal rate of return 
internal rate of return and net present value use time value of money present value calculations payback method does not again because we're going to be looking at these uh, well I'll talk about present value in a minute when we talk about our uh, cash flows we talk about cash outflows versus cash inflows cash outflows obviously include what the initial investment how much are we going to spend on this investment at the very beginning also we'll probably have to maintain this piece of equipment so we'll look at repairs and maintenance we'll look at incremental operating costs maybe because we get this new asset now we're going to have a little bit more in our operating costs we're gonna to have to pay more for electricity or something like that that would be a cash outflow and then we will look at a tie up of working capital what does that mean with working capital tie up that means that we are sitting there and we're going to have to put an initial down payment or something for example we're going to lease a piece of equipment but the guy tells us that we got to give him ten thousand dollars and he's going to hold that ten thousand dollars until what until we return his equipment back to him and it's sort of like a deposit it is a deposit that he makes us put down so that we don't tear up the equipment or something right so we know we got that cash vested that would be a tie up of working capital now that working capital one is something that students have trouble with sometimes because they forget in some of the problems to do what if the working capital is tied up at the beginning what happens to it at the end it gets released good at the end of the project right so sometimes students will come to me during the test and they'll say I can't get any of the choices is there a typo on this problem and I'm like no there's not a typo and I'll point to the working capital did you release the work oh that's right I have to release the working capital at the end right okay now we have other cash inflows which is what the incremental revenues obviously if we're doing this project it's because we think that we're going to get more revenues right out of this otherwise we'd be foolish to invest in a project that's not going to bring in more revenue we will also have as an inflow the salvage value if we're going to sell this equipment at the end so at the end of the project we can sell the equipment for ten thousand well that's cash coming back in isn't it Okay, and then we will potentially have cost reduction. You buy a newer, more efficient, more energy efficient machines, that sort of thing, right? I talked last time how companies are starting to realize, no matter who Trump appoints to the EPA, right, that what companies are starting to realize, wait a minute, even though we have to live within environmental protection laws, um, you know, by legislation, by regulation, it actually improves the efficiency of our company and uh, a lot of companies are starting to realize wait a minute there's benefit in going green etc right so maybe we invest in more energy efficient items that will give us a cost reduction but all of these are cash inflows okay now when we compare these cash inflows and cash outflows we have to worry about the time value of money time value of money says this an amount that I am going to receive in the future is worth less to me today. Think about it. You go ahead and I say, hey, uh, can I borrow a million dollars? Huh? No, go ahead. Say no. no. Yeah, of course. You don't want me to borrow a million dollars because what? I'm going to take it from you. Then you're not going to have it, right? So I say, I'll tell you what. Why don't you just let me borrow 800000 and I'll give you a million back at the end of the year. Are you willing to do that? All of a sudden, it's like, yeah, sure. So what happens? That million dollars today is only worth 800000 isn't it? Whereas in the future, it's got a bigger amount. So our present values are always going to be what? Less than the future amount that we're going to pay out. We'll see how these tables work and help us calculate that. Okay, so that's called present value accounting. We have to consider the time value of money. And so for these cash flows that go into future years, we will have to discount these cash flows. Okay, and the process is pretty easy once you get used to it. Okay, now having said that, the one of the, the first method that we're going to talk about, the payback method, does not consider the time value of money. It does not consider it. We just want to see how long is it going to take us to recoup our investment okay so we go ahead and uh, we take a look at the payback period it's the length of time that it'll take us to recoup our investment and this will help us to determine if we want to do this project or not so it's very simple 
we will take the investment initial investment required we'll divide that by what by the annual cash flows that are going to come from it and that's going to tell us how long it's going to take us to recoup the investment okay so you just look at this example we have a cost of a project 140,000 now they give us the life on this but it is not really uh, relevant to the payback method but uh, if we're using these same facts for net present value method then we would want to consider um, how long the project is okay now we're going to generate thirty five thousand dollars per year net cash inflows and they want to see what the payback method is of this espresso bar whatever okay so we take this hundred and forty thousand we divide it by the net cash flows that are going to come in each year and it turns out that it would take this company what four years to recoup the investment if you're waiting for deeper meaning stop because there is none that's it they're simply telling us what four years to recoup your investment okay now um, if the company had said well look we are not going to make any investment unless we can recoup our investment in five years then they would accept this investment right what happens if the company's policy was that they have to recoup their investment in I think you know where I'm going with this three years then what they would reject this because the payback period is longer than the threshold they'd set up for them right okay now there are significant limitations to the payback method the biggest one being that it ignores the time value of money so it is a very rough way of analyzing an investment analyzing or making a decision very rough very rough okay I would not use this frankly for any business purpose unless I'm just sitting at a bar chatting it up with uh, some potential you know business uh, partners and we're just initially getting started on talking about something right but the true analysis would have to use present value accounting okay the only time I've seen this really used at all for a quote-unquote business decision is I've seen it talked about and a lot of people use this if you're refinancing your house and you have to pay certain charges to refinance the house the rule of thumb that they use is whatever uh, your payments will be savings in your payments will be it shouldn't take you longer than two years to recover any cost for the refinancing uh, uh, by the savings of your monthly payments if it takes you longer than two years to uh, recover those upfront costs the refinancing they often tell you don't do it okay but uh, that's very rough even for that purposes I'm not sure that it's the best uh, analysis but I have seen that being a commonly accepted way of analyzing that transaction other than that we're going to use present value okay the beauty of payback is it's easy so that's good for you because if I give you one of those questions it's going to be easy for you to answer that on the exam right okay okay good now uh, payback can get a little bit more interesting if we're in a situation where the cash flows are uneven. In that other one, we were saying the cash flows were whatever, 4000 a year, whatever it was. I forget now what it was a year. So it was very easy to divide the initial investment by those even cash flows, right? What if the cash flows are uneven the way this is? Now, how would you handle that? Well, let's say, do they give me an initial investment? one of these slides had an initial investment yeah let's say that we have an initial investment of four thousand and we want to see how long it's going to take us to recover that well if you had a situation like this you'd have to do what well year one we recovered what one thousand so that leaves us three thousand dollars that we have left to recover have we recovered our investment yet okay we go to year two in year two how much do we get zero so we're now all the way into year three and we haven't recovered the investment yet what happens in year three we get another two thousand so when we get that two thousand in year three we get into year four and we still have a thousand that we have to collect don't we 
Okay, so when you get into year four and you still got a thousand to collect, and then what? You finally collect that thousand in this example in year four. So I guess by, and I don't know exactly when in year four they finally hit this the collection of a thousand, but it's not until we're well, some point into year four that we recover our investment, right? So if the company thought that, you know, that uh, they shouldn't accept an investment unless it will pay back in three years, we would reject this, wouldn't we? If the company's policy was five years, we're all in on this, right? Okay. Okay, good. Um, I know it's hard to concentrate if you're thinking that, you know, you want your uh, football team to win the game or something, but uh, this is not text time. This is not Raider time. This is accounting 101 time, your last chance before your final to understand something about what you're trying to get a B in. Okay, so let's keep the... Uh, Eye on the prize here, okay? The Raiders won't send a check to your house if they win, okay? All right, so let's go ahead and let's take a look at um, a couple of questions here using the payback method, and it's uh, pretty easy. Um, but they do bring out a nice point here, actually, that we don't see on the slides. And so we're saying that this company has an investment, and it's what, eight-year life on the investment, and it's going to require 300000 up front with no salvage value. So we know that our numerator is going to be 300000 because that's the initial investment. And now we want to see what our annual cash flows are going to be on it. Now what's interesting about this problem is they give me the operating income. They don't call out the cash flows, right? Operating income is an accrual number, isn't it? And that accrual number includes depreciation expense. Does depreciation expense use cash? It does not use cash. So what do I do? I take the operating income and then I have to do what? Add back the depreciation expense. Now I have the cash flow that's being generated from this investment after I consider my operating income and add back the depreciation, right? Hello? Right, contribution margin minus my fixed expenses, but then they tell me, hey, some of that is depreciation. If I want to get cash flows off of this investment, I have to do what? What the cash flows are off of this investment, I have to add back the depreciation, don't I? Now I have the cash flows. Okay, so I'm turning this income number to a cash number, and when I get the cash flows, I go ahead and I divide the initial investment by those annual cash flows net cash flows and that gives me what two years okay it's just that simple that's it question okay good let's go ahead then and let's take a look at this one and uh, they tell us to ignore income taxes in these problems. And yes, we will not think about income taxes in Accounting 101. If I'm teaching Accounting 305, I would absolutely make my students, my accounting students, uh, consider the depreciate. I mean, consider the what? The taxes, because you have to have an after-tax cash flow to do this correctly. You got to pay your taxes, don't you? Okay, but we're not going to do that in this class. But you should be aware of that. Uh, that, you know, to do this properly, we would consider the tax effects. But anyway, we have this buy right pharmacy has purchased a small auto for delivering prescriptions. The auto, the auto was purchased for 28,000 and will have a six year useful life and salvage value of 4,000. Delivering prescriptions has never been done before and it should increase gross revenue by 32,000. That's a cash inflow that's coming from this thing, isn't it? Okay, cash inflow of 32000 that's coming. And then they say the cost of the prescriptions is 25000 So I'm going to have a net cash inflow coming in on this thing if I'm doing my math right of what, 7000 Peek over here, 7000 Okay, now I initially spend this 28000 so if I take the 28000 and divide it by the $7,000 a year, that's even I can do in my head. That's what? Four years to recoup the investment? Right? Okay. Okay. So pretty easy, right? Payback method? 
And that's about the only thing that I have good to say about it is it's easy in terms of being a true analysis tool. <laughs> Forget about it, okay? But uh, something to be aware of, okay? More uh, appropriately used is going to be the net present value method. Net present value method does what? It sits here and it says that we're going to consider the time value of money. We're going to sit here and we're going to discount future cash flows in order to be able to compare them to the current. And it's usually an outflow that we're going to be making for the initial investment. Okay, so we just can't compare, you know, apples to oranges. We have to turn everything to however you want to look at it, apples, I guess, to apples. Okay, so we come over. And we take a look and we'll look at the cash flows, both inflows and outflows, just like we did for the payback method. But now we're going to be using present value accounting to discount the cash flows. So let's just take a look. And when we're using the net present value method, we will accept a project if it has a net present value of zero or a positive net present value. If its net present value is zero or positive, we'll accept it. If the net present value is negative, we will reject that project. That's telling us that we're not getting the rate of return that we're expecting from this project if we get a negative net present value. If we get zero or greater than zero, that's telling us that we're getting our what? If it's zero, that means we're exactly getting our required rate of return. And if it's more than zero, we're doing even better than our required rate of return. So this is a good way to screen a project. I'm sitting here. I have a pile of money that I want to invest. I'm trying to decide which projects I want to invest in. And I only take those that have a positive net present value. Now, we'll get into this later, but you could also use this as a ranking tool, not just a screening tool, but a preference tool. What happens? Pile of money, bunch of investments that I want to make, and I'm going to do what? I'm going to take the one with the highest net present value first and then work my way down the list going in inverse order down to those with lower net present values until I'm out of money to invest, right? So it's not only a screening project uh, uh, tool, but it is also uh, a way of deciding uh, against the different preferences tool as well. Okay, So let's just go ahead and let's take a look at this example where we'll use the net present value method. And we have this cost of this equipment, 160000 That's the initial amount going out. We have a tie-up of working capital at the very beginning. That's 100000 going out. In three years, and this is where we start getting into, we're now going to be comparing cash flows from different periods. Three years from now, we're going to have to reline the equipment. So we're going to have some repairs and maintenance that we're going to have to make in three years. What else? We will be able to sell the equipment at the end of the project in five years for a salvage value of 5000 So that's an amount that's going to be coming in, but it is what? Several years down the road, isn't it? Okay, so we're going to have to use present value accounting for this. Then what? On an annual basis, we'll have seven, sales revenue of 750000 The cost of the parts sold will be 400000 We have to pay salaries and shipping, so we're going to have to calculate a net cash inflow from this investment, right? And all of this is going to have to use present value accounting in order for us to uh, figure out whether or not we should do this investment to see if it has a positive net present value. So I go ahead and they tell me that the company's expected rate of return is 11%. That's sort of what they say is their hurdle. We're not going to take a project unless it gives us a return of 11%. And we'll know that it gives us a return of 11% or better if the net present value is either zero or greater than zero. If it's less than zero, that by definition means that we are not getting that rate of return of 11% at some amount less. So we want to try to get uh, something with a positive net present value to help us get an 11% return. So we come over and we first calculate the net cash inflows. And so we have this initial investment of 750000 We have the cost of the parts sold, just taking that information from that previous slides. And we have salaries of 270000 in the shipping. So we have net cash inflows of what? 80,000 a year on this project for what was it five year project okay then what then we sit there and we start to do our present value calculations now 
The 160,000 initial investment has a present value factor of one because what? 160,000 that we're paying out today is equal to 160,000, right? The tie up of the working capital that happens today now is what? Present value of 100,000. The amount that you're paying today is that amount, right? So we don't have to do any real calculations there. Now, we take that 80,000 net cash inflow, and because that's going to come out over the period of the next five years, we need to get a present value of that. So we need to sit here and go to a table that will give us this factor, and we go to the present value of the annuity factor for five years at 11%, and we see that factor in there. We multiply that by the 80,000, and that gives us the present value of those future cash flows of 80,000. If it's 80,000 times five, that's what? 400,000. But notice the present value is less than 400,000 because amounts in the future are worth less than amounts today, aren't they? Or I should say the other way around. The amount today is worth less than amounts in the future because we're going to have to wait for that money, right? So we pick up that present value factor from the present value of the annuity table. Now, how do we use that table? And I'm going to go ahead and uh, try to find that file without uh, having too much of a disruption here. Let's see if I can find it quickly. That's a dream that I'm going to find it quickly. Let's see. Present value tables. Well, that didn't take too long. Don't, don't say anything, John. It hasn't opened yet. Okay. I'll give you the tables. I even have the tables in, the, uh, in this mock exam that we're going to use. So you'll see it'll be something like that. Okay, in fact, uh, well, I'll, I'll, get, I'll have the tables for you for sure. I'll either have the tables or I'll have the present value factors embedded in the individual questions, one or the other. Okay, but you're going to need to know which ones to use. I won't give you the exact ones. So let's just take a look at this. And we have these present value tables. Okay, and these were on iLearn. Okay, but we have these present value tables. And this one is present value of a dollar. Present value of a dollar is the table that we use if we just have a one-time payment. Just a one-time payment. A one-time payment, and we're trying to get the present value of that, we use present value of a dollar table. That one that we were looking at was not a one-time payment. It was what? 80,000, 80,000, 80,000, 80,000, 80,000. It was five of them, wasn't it? So we can't use this table, right? We have to go to a table that is for multiple payments, and the table that is for multiple payments is called present value of an annuity. Present value of an annuity. Present value of an annuity. If you buy a lottery ticket tonight, if they're for sale tonight, whatever, I don't know. I don't play the lottery. What's the odds of winning the lottery? 49 million to one. Okay, so take the number one and divide it by, there's 49 million different combinations of numbers that they can come up with, with those numbers that are on the lottery ticket. So take the number one and divide it by 49 million. See what number shows up on your ca calculator screen? That's your odds of winning, okay, which is zero. Okay, so what happens? I don't buy the lottery ticket for that reason. That's kind of like saying, maybe I'll get killed by lightning tonight. Nobody walks around thinking that's going to happen, but the chances that that's going to happen are greater than the winning the lottery. Yet everyone buys a lottery ticket. Okay, anyway, so what happens? Um, what was I talking about? Annuity. Annuity, <laughs> thank you. You buy the what? <laughs> Someone's got to keep me straight, right? What happens? You sit there and you buy a lottery ticket and you're hoping that what? You win and then they're going to pay you out an annuity over what? Over the next, you know, 20 years, whatever. They'll pay you $500,000 a year or something stupid like that. I don't know, whatever it comes out to in these jackpot winnings, right? So that's an annuity, isn't it? When amounts come out over a certain, certain period of time on a regular basis. And for this, this class, we just assume everything's going to be an annual payment that's going to come in, those 80000 thousands. okay? So we found the right table, didn't we? Because that's a stream of payments, an annuity. And they told us in the problem that the interest rate was what they were looking for? 11% was the interest rate we were looking for. Good.
right there. Oh, that, that's irritating. Okay. When I touch it with my finger, then it went ahead and printed. Okay, we went ahead and wrote. Okay, so it's 11%, right? And then what? I'm sitting here, and how many periods was the project? Five periods with the project, so I'm right here. 3.69590. Was that the number that they used in the example? Pretty close. They rounded, didn't they? We didn't round in ours. That's all right. Please, let's not get into a rounding discussion, guys. There will be no choices that, you know, you'll have to sit there and decide because there's a couple of rounding differences, right? Okay. Okay, good. So is that the factor they picked up? 11%, five periods. They multiply that times these annual payments, uh, net cash inflows of 80000 right? Okay. Okay, good. Then we come over and we take a look at that. And remember, when they reline the equipment... And I'm staying in out of the uh, slideshow mode because I want to get back to that table. When they reline the equipment, it is what? It is a one-time payment, isn't it, of $30,000? you will have to do that relining one time. So when I go over back to the analysis here, the present value analysis, there's my annuity amounts for my $80,000 annual cash inflows. There's that one-time payment that's coming out, but I don't use an annuity because what? It is a one-time payment, isn't it? So I go over to my tables. Can I use this table? I have to go over to the present value of the dollar table. And when I come to the present value of the dollar table now, now am I on the right table? I'm going to use what? 11%. Five years is what? 0.59345. Is that pretty much the number they used? Oh. That's why it didn't seem to sound right. So it's 0 0.731. Thank you. So I come over and it's what? Three years. So I have to come up here. Not that one, but this one. 0 0.73119. Okay. And so I come over and I look back and that's pretty much the number they use except they round it, right? So now I've got the present value of that one-time payment for the realignment of the equipment, right? Okay. Okay, good. Now I come over. This realignment of the equipment only happens once. This 80,000 is going to come in. That's our annual net cash inflows. So we'll get 80,000 in year one, 80,000 in year two, year three, year four, year five, whereas the 30,000 only comes out in year three. Okay, so for the uh, present value of the annuity, we came over and we used, had to use present value of the annuity table because what? Because it's more than one payment. And this table contemplates more than one payment, doesn't it? Okay. How do I know if I'm on the annuity table, other than the fact that it says annuity on top of it? But how would I know just by looking at those numbers? Yeah, if in fact, they're what? They're bigger in a certain way. Every single number on this table is bigger than one because I have what? More than one payment, don't I? Except for what? The one payment row, which has numbers less than one. And I'm of the opinion that Trump should pass a law that all tables, all present value of annuity tables, should take that one payment row off of it. Isn't that what Trump should do? Because it doesn't make any sense. Why have a one payment row on an annuity table when annuity means it's more than one payment, isn't it? So they really should get rid of that row. And then what? Then all payments would be more than one. Uh, all I should numbers, I should say, would be more than one, wouldn't they? And they should be because the payments are more than one. Now you sit in here and you say, but John, if it's five years, why aren't these numbers five? They're not five. None of them are because what? We know that the present value is going to be less than that future value. So we got to get it less than five, don't we? Okay. So that's how you know that you're on the right tables if you got numbers that are pretty much bigger than one, except that first row, which in my opinion doesn't belong there. Okay. Okay, good. So we go through. Does that answer your question?
Yeah. Okay. So we go through and we take a look here and we go ahead and we get the present value of that one time payment, picking that pay up from the present value of the dollar table, right? Then we come over and we take a look at the salvage value that's going to come back. And I know, guys, it gets hard to remember where some of these numbers were coming from. But remember, they said we were going to what? Salvage the equipment in five years. And when you salvage the equipment, you what? You only pay that once, right? You can only sell a piece of equipment once. So we go to present value of a dollar. And now that is going to be what? That is going to be five years when I look at the table. And then we have this um, release of the working capital that will come at the end. Remember, guys, I told you that's the one thing that you'll probably forget is to release the working capital at the end of the project. So you take a look, and that's what they did here. They picked up the present value factor for the scrap and the release of the working capital at the end of the project, right? And that's that 0.593. Those are both one-time occurrences. So we go to the present value of the dollar table. And I think I had already circled that number by accident, right, uh, for the five uh, – for the five years, right? There's that number, 0.59345, whatever. Okay, and again, on here, they went ahead and they rounded the number. That's fine. Okay? Yes? Okay, so, uh, so the 0.731 came one-time payment? Yeah. You paid it in year four? Paid in year three. Year three. We had to realign the equipment in year three, so we went to the three-year row on there. And then for the other two, they were also one-time payments, but they came in year five. So we had to go to the five-year row. We were still in the 11% column, though, right? Okay. Okay. Well, that's pretty easy, right? Okay. And so what happens when we take our what? Our cash outflows, usually, guys, cash outflows are going to happen, the big ones, up front at the beginning of the project, right, when we're making that initial investment. And then what? Then we're going to have our cash inflows coming later, and there might be one cash outflow later if we have some sort of repair or something that we have to make on this, okay? And we net all that out, and we end up with a positive net present value of 76015 Do you want to do this project? You'll do this project because it has a, do you guys use the term hell of? Or is that a Hayward thing? It has a hell of net present value, doesn't it? Because what, it's like 76,015. And we would have taken what? We would have taken a project that had a zero net present value. This one's pretty positive, right? Okay. Okay, good. Now, we come over and we remind you then that if we have a positive net present value, we should accept the project. If we have a zero net present value, we should accept the project. If we have a negative net present value, we will what? Likely reject the project. I mean, it's not like we automatically have to reject. You know, if it has a negative net present value of one cent, you know, then I'd say your rate of return is 11%. I'd say you're pretty close. Might as well go for it, right? But the further it gets away from being positive, the more likely we'll reject it. Okay. Question? All right, good. So with that, let me do this real quick. Um, I'm going to put us back into slide mode. And uh, for some reason, I realized the other day I started internal rate of return discussion, and then all of a sudden I had these net present value calculations in the middle of the problem and I, for some unexplainable reason. And so I'll come back to the internal rate of return. Let's just try some problems using net present value. Okay, so I'm just jumping ahead to some of the questions with that. And so we have this uh, initial investment of 360000 Annual net cash inflows of 118,000 for a year. Life on the project discount rate is 12%. Okay. Now the way I like to do these is I put amounts that I'm going to pay now versus amounts that are going to be coming in or being paid in the future. And then in between them, I put a what? Present value factor.
Okay, this is the way I set these up. Amounts that are going to go in the future versus now. And then I put a present value factor. So I have a payment that's going to come out now, which is what? This initial investment of 360000 I know is what? Is coming out now, isn't it? 360000 Then I have this 118000 that is going to be coming in in the future, isn't it? But I need a present value factor, don't I? Now, is this an annuity or is this a one-time payment? Annuity. This is an annuity because it's going to be per year. So I go over to my table and before I jump over there, it's what, 12% for four years? Okay, I want to keep that so I don't lose that writing. And I'm going to go over to my Table, present value of annuity. Huh? Is that the table I want? I need present value of an annuity. So I come over and I'm going to look for the factor that is going to be, what, 11%? 12%? Whew, barely made it onto this table. Okay. 12% for how many years? Four years. So the factor, one, two, three, four, I'm looking for is 3.0375. Okay, 3.0375. Somebody remember that number? 3.0375. I come back. I take that 118,000. I multiply it times 3.0375. Did I pick up the right number? Okay. I multiply that 118,000 by 3.0375, and I get how much? Three hundred and fifty eight thousand four twenty five, I think I heard. Okay. So three hundred and twenty eight thousand four twenty five is the cash inflow versus on a present value basis, right? Versus the on a present value basis, the amount I'm gonna pay now, the three sixty, right? Right? Okay. And so I end up with a net present value of how much? I don't think it's exactly 1516. What is it? 1575 5, thereabouts. Okay. So, but obviously what? Obviously the right answer is given here, right? We find that that's the right answer. Now, why is there a difference? Because the textbook used rounded figures instead of the ones that we draw we drew out for longer decimals. Okay. The other thing that the book did, although that's not the reason for the difference, the reason for the difference is the rounding. The other thing that the book did is they discounted the cash flows one payment at a time. So they went up and picked up the present value of a dollar factor for one year, two years, three years, four years, and then multiplied each one of them out individually. And I'm saying that somebody that does that has a fetish for multiplying because there's no reason to do that when you can sit there and what? Just do a one-time multiplication by using the present value. That's why God created that table so that we could sit here and do what? Just make one calculation, right? I mean, what if it was 50 years? This guy would be here for the rest of his life trying to get these calculations right and then adding them all up, et cetera, right? Right? Can you think of a circumstance where you would have to do this? Do the cash flows one at a time, even though they came out over a period of time. If the cash flows were uneven, you'd be stuck with this, wouldn't you? You'd have to sit here and do each one of them one at a time. The beauty of that is, is that God also created something called Excel. And with Excel, you just simply do what? You just simply highlight the whole row of payments and you hit the function present value and it'll give it to you that way, right? Okay, but uh, we're going to use the tables in here, obviously. We're not going to be doing Excel calculations. Okay, was there a question, sir? Okay. All right, question? Okay, good. Let's go ahead then and let's look at another one now. And uh, this is another net present value calculation. This uh, corporation is investing um, the purchase of a new threading machine that cost 18000 The machine would save about 4000 per year. The present value of the threading parts and components would have a uh, 
over the present method, I should say, not present value, um, the machine would save about 4000 per year over the present method of threading component parts and would have a salvage value of what? 3000 in six years. Then the machine would be replaced. The required rate of return is 12%. We can still use that same table, right? Okay, and uh, so what is the net present value closest to? So, again, the way I set these up, I talk about payments that are going to come out now versus payments that are going to come out what? Later in the future. Okay, good. And I'm going to get a present value factor for these, aren't they? Right? Okay. Now, I always say get a present value factor, but I don't bore us with, you know, multiplying anything times one. The amount that, what, comes out now for the cost of the threading machine is just 18000 right? So, I take that 18000 That's coming out now. And then let's see again what's going to come in in the future. The machine would say 4000 per year. If it's 4000 per year, is that a one-time payment or annuity? Good, that's an annuity, so I'm going to put that 4000 I'm, again, going to get out of the slideshow so I can go back to the table. I want to keep that. I go back to the table, and I've got to get on the present value of the annuity table, right? And this time, I'll change the color up a little bit so we can see it easily. Is 12% 12 per, uh, 12 is the interest rate, and it was how many years? Huh? Six. So we're right here, 4.1141. Four point one one four one. Okay, so I go ahead and I pick that number up, and I'm going to go back into the uh, slideshow for this particular one, current slide, and I'm going to pick up that number four thousand times four point one one four one. Was it four one one four one? Thank you. 4,000 times 4.1141 is what? Sixteen thousand four hundred forty-five. You say? In sixty-four cents? Okay. Okay. Good. Then what? Keep reading, and the machine has a salvage value of three thousand in six years, doesn't it? Is that going to be an annuity or one time? That's one time, so 3,000 times, once again, go back to the tables. Which table do you want me to go to? Present value of a dollar, right? Not this one, but this one up here. Present value of a dollar. Where are you? Come up. 12%, right? And it was, what, six years again? Oh, no, how many years was that? That was still, because oh, it's a salvage value. That's right, because it's a salvage value. So that's at the end of the project. So that's 0 0.50663. Okay, did I pick up the right one? Yeah, 0 0.55, 0 .05, 0 0.50663. So we multiply that times... Point zero five six three three, and we get what? We get um, huh? Oh, point five. Point like that. Okay, so I multiply that, and that gives me now this, what, 1519 that's going to come in at the end of this, right? Okay, good. So I go ahead, and I have the negative initial amount that's going to have to come out, and I add in the amounts that are going to come in, and that gives me negative, what, 34.47? Okay, so that's pretty close. Again, they use a rounded version of the table that's more rounded than the one that we're using here, so that's why we have a little slightly different numbers. But clearly, that's the right answer, right? Would you do this project? 
Okay, maybe not, but I think management's getting a little greedy, you know, to turn this down because, well, it's $34 negative value. Meanwhile, you're getting a 12% return, okay? That's not that bad. Now, if you got, you know, 10 other projects that you want to try first that are giving you a 20% return, then okay. But this is all you got. You're not going to reject it just because it's a few bucks off from having a return of 12%, right? Okay, so again... The closer you get to zero, the better. Okay, but you'd like it zero, and you'd like it positive because that means an even greater return. Okay, good. So I'm not going to do this one because we're going to practice with some of these in the uh, mock midterm. So you're going to get some more practice with these here in a little while. So no sense in beating a compliant horse. Let's go ahead and um, let's... Uh, look at internal rate of return. So I'm going back a little bit because, again, I stuck the questions in the wrong place. I put some questions after the discussion of in, 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 internal rate of return when I don't have to. Okay, Guys, this is not the time to be flirting. This is the time to be paying attention to this up here. Flirt after class. It'll be much more enjoyable because you'll actually know that you're going to get a good grade on the test. Okay, All right, so let's go ahead and let's take a look at the internal rate of return and internal rate of return is that rate of return that will cause the net present value of the project to be zero in other words what net present value of a project will be zero when the cash when the present value of the cash inflows are equal to the present value of the cash outflows won't that make the net present value zero Okay, so whatever that interest rate is, we call that our internal rate of return. Now, what happens? We will set up a hurdle rate, a minimum rate of return. And if our internal rate of return is equal to or greater than that hurdle rate, then we will accept the project. If the internal rate of return is less than that hurdle rate, we will do what? reject the project and think about it makes sense hurdle rate hurdle rate is 11 percent internal rate of return is 10 percent did we hurdle it no we tripped over it didn't we okay and so what we'd reject that project our hurdle rate is uh 12 percent internal rate of return is 13 percent we would accept that project right okay now how will we come up with the internal rate of return Okay, I just want to go and look at this example where we have this machine. I don't know what this is, smog machine, whatever it is. And we're sitting here saying, okay, the machine will cost us $104,320. It's going to save us $20,000 per year, and the machine is going to have a 10-year life. Okay, so we come over, and we want to figure out what the internal rate of return is on this. Now, they set this up here where they show you how to come up with the present value factor by taking the investment required and dividing it by the annual cash flows. Okay, but I'm going to do this a little bit different. We know that the present value of the annual cash flows I don't want to put present value next to it, though. Let me do it this way. It makes more sense. We know that we have to take the annual cash flows, right? And we have to do what? We have to sit there and multiply that times the present value factor. And if that equals the initial investment... Then by definition, what? The present value of my annual cash flows are equaling my initial investment. Thus, my net present value is zero, isn't it? My net present value is zero if what? The present value of my future cash flows equal what? Equal my, uh, I mean, you know, my the present value of my future cash flows, uh, positive cash flows equal my initial investment, which is negative, right? If that's the case, the net present value is zero, isn't it? Right? 
present value of the future cash flows equal my initial investment net present value is zero so I've set this thing up to make the net present value zero haven't I then I simply go ahead and I do what divide each side by my annual cash flows guys I'm not going to rewrite what's already here if I divide each side by the annual cash flows then I'm left on one side with what just the present value factor and I have on the other side the investment required divided by the annual cash flows don't I right so now I have the present value I have the present value factor that will make my cash flows equal to my initial investment to make my net present value zero don't I so now I'm going what's the matter did I hear pain did I hear a cry for help? <laughs> okay, do you understand that my annual cash flows times my present value factor has to equal my initial investment for my net present value to be zero? Yes. Okay, we're there? Okay, good. Then we're a long way towards your understanding of this. We're right there. Okay, because what happens? Then all I did, um, tell me again. Felicity. Felicity. Then all I did at that point was I just did the algebra. I simply divided each side by the annual cash flows. If I divide each side by the annual cash flows, I'd probably be easier if I just maybe I should, right? If I divide each side by the annual cash flows, I'm just going to write it, but it's going to be kind of silly after I do it. Then it's going to be initial investment divided by annual annual cash flows um, is going to be present value factor on this side right which is this right here I mean that's just the same thing right I just did the algebra I'd divide each side by the annual cash flows and I'm left with present value factor on this side initial uh, investment on this side right okay and in this example now just going back it's a hundred and four thousand three twenty is the cost of machine annual cash flows are twenty thousand when they divided it they got the present value factor didn't they so I've got the present value factor now right with me so far Okay, now what they're going to do is they're going to use the table backwards. They're going to go to the present value of the annuity table. They're going to go to the present value of the annuity table and they're going to do what? How many years was the project? Ten years? How many years was this project? Ten years. Okay. So they're going to go ahead and they're going to go to the present value of the annuity table. They're going to come down to the 10-year row and they're going to run their finger along this thing until they find that present value factor. And of course, what's going to happen? Is this the table that doesn't have it? Yeah, this doesn't have it. Okay, so um, what was the number I was looking for? 5 point what? 216, yeah, so I have to go to the other table. And I can't tell you who decides that a table should stop at 12%. I don't know. I don't know. Again, if Trump, you know, wants to help the world, he should make the tables have all percentages be one, two, three, all the way up to 50%. So we don't have to look for another table that has the number we're looking for. But whatever, I had to go to another table because it wasn't on this stupid one. Present value of, is this the right table? Huh? That's present value of a dollar. And I know because all the numbers are what? less than one so I come over here here we go how many periods was it 10 periods and I'm looking for what 5 5.5.216 5 there it is thank God and look in the classroom 
there's always the factor exactly, okay? In real life, you might have a difference between the factors and you have to do something called interpolation, and I'm not going to get into that in this class. There will always be like, you know, Dora the Explorer, what took you so long? And you'll finally get it, and it'll be perfect at the end, okay? So what happens? It's 14% is the return, right? And I know that by coming up the column. Okay, so I basically use the table backwards, don't I? Right? Okay. Okay, good. So when I do that, then I can answer this question, which is the internal rate of return for this project is what? 14%, isn't it? Okay, and they show me the same thing. They just did the same thing we did. They came to 14%. I just showed you on the table, but that's the internal rate of return. Now, if the company's what hurdle rate is 12%, will they take this project? They'll take this project, right? If the company's hurdle rate is 15%, will they take this project? No. Yeah, we saw that already. Okay. I don't know why that's there again. All right, I'm not going to do this question. I want to do, let's do one from the, uh, from the book. Okay. Okay, good. So from the from the actual uh, problems. And after this, guys, I'm going to turn you loose on these questions. Okay, we're going to take the break. Yeah, our timing is about right, I guess. Oh, it's a little, little longer than I thought. We'll take a quick break, about 10 minutes, and then I'm going to have you do the questions, yeah, till about 9. And then we're going to go through and we're going to go through those questions together. Okay? Sound like a plan? Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and let's take a look at this. And they're telling us that we have the internal rate of return. We know that the internal rate of return is going to be the what? Annual cash flows times a present value factor is going to have to equal what? Our initial investment. Okay, and so our what? Our present value factor that we want to get is going to be equal to our initial investment divided by the annual cash flow, right? Okay, good. So do I have an annual cash flow here? I mean, do I have an initial investment here? I'm going to have to purchase this truck, whatever, for 178000 848 with me so far okay and they tell me that the net cash flows are what 36,000 I divide that just doing this formula right here now right it's not even a formula I mean it's just you know logic here really and when I do that I get this factor over here 4.968 so I go ahead and I come over to the table present value of annuity table right and I look for I'm sorry how many years was the project eight years. eight years good so I run my finger along the eight years and I'm looking what 4.968 there it is there it is so my what my internal rate of return is 12 percent on this okay and so I come over and uh, take a look and that's uh, we had already seen that that's the correct answer is 12 percent right Question? Okay, good. Let's go ahead, guys. Let's take a 10-minute break. We're going to come back at 8.20. That's about perfect. We will spend 40 minutes doing the mock midterm, and then we will go through the mock midterm starting at 9 o'clock and probably take us up to the rest of the class to finish that, going through it, okay? Okay, guys, I'll see you in 10 minutes, okay?